Okay, now let's begin. Sorry for the short delay. Um, I would like to say a few words about our next uh, speaker. This is the talk which should begin at 12.20. It will last about one hour 20. And it's more like a workshop and not a presentation. And the title is Let's Stop EU Copyright Expansion. The speaker, uh, Christopher Clay, welcome Christopher, is a um, founding member of uh, the MetaLab, the Vienna Hackers, and also uh, was part of the Austrian um, Pirate Party. And right now he's uh, communicating with uh, Julia, what's her name? Julia Reda in the European Parliament. And the talk will be about plans of the EU Commission to install an extra copyright for new site and uh, an obligation for internet platforms to survey all user uploads. Sounds for me quite malicious. What we can do about it and why we should do something about it, this you will learn from Christopher Clay. Give him a warm applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. So like it has been said, this is supposed to be a workshop. So I. I'm here to get your feedback and to get you to take some action. So again, I would like to ask if you want to move forward a little bit. Uh, that would be super useful because once I've given an introduction about the topic, I'm going to jump down here and talk to you. Uh, and so it would be easier if you can talk back. Um, so it's been almost 15 years since the European Union reformed its copyright framework. In 2000, well, over 15 years. In 2001, the InfoSoc Directive, which outlines European copyright, um, was passed. And that was a time before Wikipedia was famous, before Facebook existed, before YouTube existed, before we all had machines in our pockets with which we can remix content, create content, publish it globally. And so these rules are woefully out of date. They are mostly meant uh, to target com So many rules that used to target companies uh, interacting with copyright uh, now target everyone because we all in our everyday life uh, share things and um, create things. Here. Excellent. OK. Um, so finally, after a decade, the EU said, OK, we have to look at copyright again. Um, another problem is that it's extremely fragmented. There are 28 different copyright laws. For example, which exceptions to copyright apply is different from country to country, because they are not uh, mandatory. They are optional. Each country can choose which ones to implement and which ones not. So what we would have needed would have been an update of copyright to the digital age. Uh, an expansion and harmonization of users' rights in copyright. Um, but we got none of this because Digital Commissioner Oettinger was responsible for creating this reform. And what he came up with are several proposals that mostly aim to protect the business models of large European industries uh, from change through the internet. So for the publishing industry, which feels threatened by Facebook and Google, uh, the proposal is to introduce an extra copyright specifically for news websites, for the publishers of news websites. So right now, the journalists already have copyright for the articles they write, but the publishers don't have their own layer of rights. And they say uh, that platforms like Facebook and Google are totally abusing that by using snippets of news content. Like in Google News, when you see a headline and a, the first sentence of an article, or a thumbnail image, or like on Facebook, when someone shares a news article, these same things show up, a thumbnail, a, a headline, a snippet. Uh, they say this is an abuse of their rights to reproduce in your Facebook stream the headline of a news article. And they want this extra copyright, so they can go to Facebook and Google and say, pay us a couple million a year, and then we won't sue you for spreading our headlines and snippets. So again, this doesn't apply to full articles or anything like that. It's about these tiny little bits of content, uh, which they want an extra copyright to, to protect. It's supposed to last for 20 years, 
it's supposed to apply retroactively, and there is no limit to limited to Facebook or Google. So it would also affect bloggers who quote um, or who reproduce parts of news articles. And it has no minimum length, like even three words could be a, a violation. That's the proposal for publishers. Um, for the music industry, there's a different proposal because they uh, also feel threatened by YouTube. They think YouTube doesn't pay them enough money. They have come up with this lobbying term called the value gap. Um, if they list the amount of money they get per play of a song on Spotify and the amount of money they get per play of a video on YouTube, they get less on YouTube because it's obviously a totally different business model. It's based on ad, uh, ad revenue sharing and on Spotify it's based on subscription fees and the result is that the YouTube income is less and they say the difference between this is the value gap which is being stolen from them by YouTube. Um, so what they want to do is to get a stronger negotiating position against uh, YouTube and the law that Mr. Ertinger came up for for that purpose is to force all internet platforms that host a large amount of user uploaded content to filter every, to surveil and scan every upload uh, for copyright, potential copyright infringement. So they can prevent copyrighted things from even going online. If that sounds uh, familiar to you, that's kind of like YouTube's content ID system already works. They already scan every video you upload and try to find copyrighted content in there. Um, but at that point, uh, this is, YouTube is doing this voluntarily. Um, so they want this law to, so that YouTube is in a worse position because now they would be forced by law to do the thing they already do. Of course, again, this would not just affect YouTube, this would affect any platform that hosts a large amount of user uploaded content. For example, small blogging communities or um, even platforms like Wikipedia, uh, there is no exception for like platforms that only host Creative Commons content or that are community run or anything like that. As soon as you have a large amount of user uploaded data, you will have to introduce filters. This would also affect uh, online platforms that deal with content types that aren't usually uh, a problem for copyright infringement and where technology doesn't even yet exist to scan uploaded content. For example, we have a case of a small company in Europe who has a, who's running a, a, a music notation sheet uh, sharing site. Uh, they would also have to scan every uploaded notation sheet, whatever it's called exactly, uh, for like copyrighted melodies and that technology doesn't even exist. Uh, SoundCloud tells us they spend like three, four million uh, euros per year on such technology. YouTube has spent 30 million about, around 30 million. So every European platform would have to implement uh, such very costly technology. And then of course, what will it lead to? Uh, it will lead to legitimate uploads being taken down because an algorithm can never differentiate between a, a valid use of copyrighted content that is covered by copyright exceptions, for example, quotation or parody. It cannot differentiate between you know, a parody video that includes a snippet of a song and a copyright infringement. That is something an algorithm cannot make the decision on. So the platforms, of course, fearing being sued by the music industry will just take everything down and then you will have to fight to get your video back online if it was legitimate. Um, yeah, the other things I will, I guess, uh, well, I'll mention them shortly. So one other big contentious issue is uh, for the first time, Europe is going to get an uh, exception, so a, an allowance for text and data mining, so for um, automatically reading and analyzing a lot of copyrighted content. Uh, that's Right now, it's unclear whether that's legal or not. Uh, they will introduce an uh, exception. That means it will be legal, but only for uh, research institutions in the public interest, so not for hackers and hobbyists and startups and academia and any, well, academia research institutions maybe, but uh, not, not for journalists, not for anyone else who uh, wants to data mine. So this exception that they're planning to introduce, which is good, is gonna be extremely limited in scope, which is bad. Um, and then they are debating in the European Parliament right now whether they should add to this reform uh, package 
an exception for uh, remixing and user-generated content. That would be amazing and really what we need, but it's not looking very good that this will actually happen. So let me talk a bit about the process. So the European Commission has last year made these proposals. Again, like I said, mainly handouts to industry um, to protect obsolete business models. Now the European Parliament and the European Council can voice their opinions on this and suggest changes. And they have to approve this law before it goes into effect. The European Parliament are the directly elected uh, representatives of the people of Europe, and the European Council, that is the member state governments of, of Europe. So they both have to find an opinion. And this process is ongoing in the European Parliament, and it, you know, it takes about a year. We're getting close to the end of it. Several different committees have already voted, and it's gone very badly. Um, the committee that is responsible for science policy in the European Parliament has said, this idea of an extra copyright for news sites is great, and we should expand it to scientific articles. Scientific articles should also, you shouldn't be able to quote, the pu scientific publishers should have this extra copyright, so that not just the author of the article, but the publisher of the journal can also prevent you from quoting from that scientific article. That's what the scientific, like the, the industry committee, industry and research committee of the European Parliament has said in its vote. Uh, yeah, the culture committee similarly said good ideas. The internal market and consumer protection committee was a little bit better, but also they couldn't find a majority on the topic of an extra copyright for news sites. They couldn't, they, so they have no opinion on this. They couldn't decide whether to reject it or whether to call for expanding it. Nothing got a majority, so they have no opinion, so they support uh, what's already on the table. This is pretty tragic. We were <laughs> expecting this to go differently. The main committee is the Legal Affairs Committee. That's the most important one. That's still missing. They will vote in October, this October, probably. It might be moved back, but probably October. Um, and there, yeah, don't ex we can't expect it to solve these problems, like Article 11, the extra copyright of news sites, and Article 13, these censorship machines, online upload filters, they need to be removed. They will harm the European internet, they will harm freedom of expression, they will harm internet startups in Europe, um, and they won't even work. They won't even create the purpose they were intended for, like giving money to, the, to these industries, because of course Google and Facebook, the big platforms, are gonna find ways around it, they're gonna change the way they display news when you share it, and so on, they're just not gonna pay up. So it's gonna be a lose-lose situation, and we need to remove them. Uh, there is no majority for that in the European Parliament, in this committee that's gonna vote in October. There might be an opportunity to make these proposals weaker, but that's not good enough, we need to actually remove them. So, to give you an idea, this Legal Affairs Committee, that's about 40 members of the European Parliament from all these different groups. Um, the majority is right, right of center. Um, so, there's the progressive groups are Social Democrats, part of them at least, the Greens, the left. Um, they are short of a majority. For a majority, you need either some conservatives or you need the Eurosceptics and the Nazis. That's the situation in the parliament. Um, so, who's fighting here? So on, on, on the side of a progressive copyright are several organizations uh, that deal with digital rights, um, like um, EDRI, European Digital Rights, or C4C, that's a big alliance that includes Creative Commons, for example, it's a copyright for creativity. Um, there are NGOs that fight for open access that are on our side, there's Mozilla, uh, EFF, libraries and archives uh, are also on our side. They want to, um, they, they don't want to make copyright more complicated like these proposals would do. Um, and also the scientific community, the independent scientific community. So um, the, there's overwhelming consensus that these proposals would be harmful. Um, I will just quote from some, indep some independent uh, academic feedback. So there is independent scientific consensus that this extra copyright for news sites cannot be allowed to stand, said an open letter from Europe's leading uh, research centers for uh, intellectual property law. 
Uh, an open letter by 37 IP professors said it's unnecessary, undesirable, would introduce an unacceptable level of uncertainty, and would be unlikely to achieve anything. It's an interference with freedom of speech. It may set back the function of the press as a public watchdog. It's contrary to the objective of creating a single European digital market. Detrimental for authors' interest. Negative impact on small publishers. Risks having repercussions for the acceptability and legitimacy of the copyright system as a whole. It will not foster quality journalism. It adversely affects authors. It directly affects the communication of the European population. It will not create additional revenues. It will privilege large providers such as Google. Small European entities will be prevented from entering the market. The final result may be further market concentration, less information diversity. I have never in my life and in my work at the European Parliament heard independent academics this clearly and unanimously rejecting a legal proposal. They usually don't speak in such language. It's usually very complex, hedging their bets, uh, but it, there is just overwhelming majority. This is not a pirate party position. There is overwhelming opinion uh, and consensus that these would be horrible proposals for the internet in Europe, but nobody cares in the European Parliament. Policymakers do not care if they've even read this, they read it and shrug it off because on the other hand are the industry lobbies who say they need this, journalism is going to die if they don't get this right, uh, musicians are going to die, we're all going to die, uh, the kids of creators will not have food on their table, uh, we need this, we need this, and that is so much louder than all the academics uh, combined. It's uh, just the same with the uh, censorship machines proposal, um, yeah, it's been found by studies to be incompatible with existing EU law, which prohibits uh, countries from introducing general monitoring on internet platforms. Uh, it's incompatible with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. It's ambiguously worded and inconsistent. Yeah, privatized censorship, says Edry. Very negative impacts on the internet. Violence funda violates fundamental rights, and so on. So there's really no debate whether these proposals are good or bad, except in the committee that will vote on whether to impose them on us for the next decade or so in Europe. Uh, there are some campaigns trying to fight against them. Um, oh, this is in German, no? Okay. Um, Mozilla has launched a campaign called Change Copyright, which is pretty cool. They promoted it on Firefox uh, fairly uh, strongly. Um, but they're also not really getting through in the parliament. They're doing like tweet your MEP campaigns, but it's not really having an impact that we've noticed so far. Um, more specifically, there's the Save the Link campaign. That's a Canadian NGO who are fighting against this extra copyright for news sites. Um, they also are doing like open letters, write your MEP campaigns, information pages. Uh, the link is under attack. Um, so they are fighting here against this one proposal. There's savethememe.net. That's a, an attempt by, I think, Bits of Freedom. That's a Dutch NGO um, to fight against this upload filtering proposal by framing it as like, your memes are in danger. Save the meme. And this has a call your MEP um, function in here. These are the Legal Affairs Committee MEPs. Um, yeah, bits of freedom. So there are sites where you can get involved, but there really hasn't been much attention paid to this issue by the activist community, by the press, by the media. I mean, the press is a tricky one because, of course, the publishers are economically interested in these proposals. And so uh, Commissioner Oettinger even specifically said at one event, like a big uh, German press meetup, uh, he told the publishers to talk to their journalists to convince them not to write bad articles on these proposals. So he said, you need to get out there if you want to protect your business model, tell your journalists why this is an amazing idea and why they shouldn't write against it. Luckily, Mr. Oettinger is no longer a digital commissioner of Europe, but of course his proposals are already on the table, and his successor, a Bulgarian, um, is continuing. I mean, they, they, they can't change direction this quickly. 
Um, in the parliament, another anecdote maybe that frustrates me to no end right now is uh, the person who was responsible for shepherding this uh, legal proposal through the European Parliament was a Maltese, called, Maltese MEP called Therese Comodini. Um, no, I don't have it on here. Who actually listened to all the stakeholders. She met with over 100 organizations and so on, and she came to very sensible proposals, despite being a conservative MEP. Uh, she really listened and she said, okay, we need to make these proposals less harmful. And she proposed doing that, uh, but then suddenly there were uh, elections in Malta and she decided she would like to become justice minister of the next Maltese government, so she decided to run for local parliament. Her party didn't end up winning, so she, they're not in government and she can't be justice minister, but she had won the seat in the local parliament. But she looked at, you know, she compared her work in the European Parliament, shaping copyright for all of Europe that she's been spending a year on, and being in the opposition of the Parliament of Malta. I'm sure it's a great country, but tiny. Um, and she decided to stay in the European Parliament, and we were very relieved. Okay, she would continue her work there. Then there was a big media shitstorm in Malta, apparently. They said, oh, she's just, she's just after the higher salary that you get in, in the European Parliament. And then there were a lot of evil comments on her Facebook page. And so she had a change of heart and decided to go with what the voters of Malta want and leave the European Parliament and drop all her work uh, that had taken her so much time to prepare and that she had come to sensible conclusions on. And it, it was taken over by a German conservative, Axel Voss from CDU. And the first thing he said was, oh, this controversial report that she ri has written, we have to drop this. And he whipped the entire conservative party in Europe uh, in line to support all these proposals without changes. So the work of a year was lost because of the Maltese local elections. <laughs> um, so we're in a bad position. The conservatives are, are strictly pro these proposals. Um, the Social Democrats are mostly on the right side, a bit split. Uh, Social Democrats from France and Belgium are very pro copyright and they're also pro these proposals. Um, the Greens are against it, the left is in theory against it, but doesn't really care enough to show up to the votes. Um, and that is generally the position. The, the Euro, Euro, um, Eurosceptic populists, the EFDD, uh, which is mostly the Italian uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle, this like uh, prot protest party run by this comedian, they are also uh, on our side, they are against these proposals but they also don't really have the resources to devote to this fight. So that's where we're at. We have until October to convince a majority of these 40 MEPs in the Justice Committee to vote against these harmful proposals. How can we do that until October? That's what I want to discuss with you in the workshop part of this. Um, there are these campaigns already. There's another one called the Copy Fighters that is going online soon that is more like the youth of Europe responding to these proposals. But as you've seen, like there's four or five different ones. It's not a very unified message. It's not, a, it's not an ACTA yet, right? It's not like we need to stop these proposals from harming the internet. And my proposal for framing these issues would be, so they are attacks on the link, the extra copyright for news sites, and on the upload, this censorship machines filtering proposal. And links and uploads are the way we interact on the internet, are the way that average people contribute to the internet, so that they're not just passive consumers. That's the way we share and that we participate online. And if we are making these processes harder, like they're trying to turn the internet into cable TV, sort of, where all we do is consume Netflix like good little consumers, and we're, getting, we're participating and getting our own voice heard is going to be harder. That's the message I propose that we campaign on. Like the, the way we participate in the web is under attack uh, unless we stop this. What do we need to do? We need to call our MEPs. We need to call like local people need to call their country's MEPs in the Legal Affairs Committee and explain to them, this is important to me. I am watching. Please vote in favor of a, of a freer internet or in, against these restrictions of a free internet. Uh, we need influential organizations to approach them. Um, for example, libraries, academics, startups have been very useful here. 
investors in startups, um, they, can, they have arguments to convince conservative MEPs. They can say this will harm the development of the economy in Europe, which is something that they will be more uh, open to hearing than digital rights arguments. Um, yeah, in each of these countries, in each of the 28 countries, or not all of them have MEPs on this committee, but uh, most of them, we need to approach our representatives, we need to get some media attention, uh, we need to get popular YouTubers involved in this. So that's two things I'm trying to do in the, in the European Parliament over the next few months, is getting famous YouTubers to care about this, because they do care because they already have bad experiences with this content ID system on YouTube, um, so it's easy to explain to them, okay, this would make this worse. Um, we are talking with a, with a like, rapper, British rapper who has like over a million subscribers who wants to do a video on this, and this we need to do in all 28 countries. So if you can help with that, just start thinking about whether you have any connections to someone who has an audience on YouTube or could put some effort into contacting them. Um, the other thing I'm trying to do is the startup angle, like um, I'm going to European internet investors and telling them they need to tell European governments that this will um, harm the investment landscape and the future of growth and jobs and the d digital economy in Europe, because I think that's a very, very potent argument uh, for conservatives and liberals. Oh, I totally forget the, forgot the liberals earlier when I was talking about the parties. The liberals are always very split on these issues. Half of them are the best you can find in the European Parliament. Half of them are pretty bad. Yep, so that is, I'm looking over my notes. I think that's generally what I wanted to tell you about the background. Let's do a Q&A on the content, uh, and then I would like to get your ideas of how we can contribute to stopping this. There is a microphone in the middle. Quick question. Sure. This equates to changing degree programs throughout the world because every type of academic research we do is based off of linking with other people's documentation, links, and information. If we take this one step further, um, how could that even be um, constitutionally valid? Because that would mean that this law would change every single degree program throughout Europe and probably throughout the world that does academic research. Okay, so, um, so what, it, what the proposal says is, let's see if I have the original text here. Um, and just before you go on, I know you say there's some loophole for academic uh, institutions. That's not good enough. Yeah. I'm a security researcher like a lot of people out here, and we actually reference other people's work to prove a point, yes. to not spread fake news and that kind of BS. And if we don't have that possibility, how can we even do research? Yes. Okay, so one important thing I should mention is this extra copyright will not change how copyright exceptions work in Europe. So these still apply, and there are copyright exceptions um, for quoting in the context of academic research, for example, that are generally implemented in all of Europe. There are exceptions for parody and all these different things. Uh, but there are not, that's why I mentioned these snippets on social networks and so on, there are, these do not currently fall under any copyright exception. So, uh, for example, in Germany, the exception to quote content um, only applies if you're doing so in an academic context, like you just said. Only applies if you're critically engaging with the work in a larger work. So posting a snippet of a news article to your Facebook page is not, does not fall under these criteria, and that's why that would be affected, but the academic use probably would not. Like I said, the one committee in the European Parliament proposed expanding it specifically to scientific articles, which be, would be horrible, but the likelihood of that actually getting through uh, to, in the other committee in the European Parliament, in the plenary of the European Parliament, and then in the negotiations with com, uh, Council and um, the Commission, so in the legislative process of the EU, are very slim. It's probably going to stay with the original proposal by the Commission, which I think would generally not change things for academic work, because it is under uh, exceptions already. Um, but it would change things for 
Well, it would create legal uncertainty, certainly. So, for you know, if a researcher is blogging about their work and quoting things, they they could potentially be sued for that. It's again, then, like it would courts would need to decide whether this applies to the situation or not. We could expect long legal battles. You're absolutely right. There are constitutional challenges that could be made to all of this. Uh, like I said, it's incompatible with existing fun charter of fundamental rights and so on. These battles will happen, but we also know that they will take like five years, a time frame in which this law will be enacted and it will be unclear what it applies to and we will have to wait for court cases um, to provide more guidance on what it actually, like for example, the censorship machines proposal contains these words, large amounts of uploaded content. What, what is a large amount? A court will have to decide based on cases. Um, so it's very hard to predict exactly what it's, it's going to affect. I would, I would guess that academics will not be very much impacted by that, except by this text and data mining uh, issue, which you also referenced. The one thing I think is a high uncertainty. Yes. The probability that that will or will not happen is right now low. Yes. The second thing is that still doesn't address security research. Security research is not currently defined as academic research. Now, if we're trying to find out if a specific nation state is attacking elections in September in Germany or in a different country, and we want to prove that based on evidence without quoting fake news, which is a third component, I mean, how the hell can you even do that? It, it's, it, it doesn't seem consistent to me. It doesn't seem logical to me. Um, the last thing is it also decreases security. Because if we can't do our job, if we can't quote other researchers that are not classified as academic, but uh, commercial companies or research institutes which aren't academic either, how is that supposed to work? I mean, the CDU is one of the biggest parties that says in Germany they want security. Yet this type of proposal will decrease security. It will give people that spread um, fake news more of a platform that goes unchecked and it stifles the democratic process of uh, discussing things in open discourse with different people. It doesn't make sense. I absolutely agree. Um, and I'm glad you're getting angry about it, because we should all be. Um, you should see the campaign site by the publishers, I'm going to try to pull it up, um, arguing for this extra copyright for news sites and against you know, quoting from articles, because they frame it as journalism in Europe needs this to survive, and if they don't get this extra right, that will prevent you from quoting them in your blog. That's bullshit. They will, yeah. like, fake news will take over the web because the good quality journalism will have no more funding. And that's the arguments they are making. And they're, they're absolutely transparently bullshit. And it's incredible how they, how they can exaggerate their argument that much. But they are getting through more than our sensible counter arguments right now. And that's what we are here to hopefully start changing. So what are the next steps? The next steps are convincing these MEPs on the Legal Affairs Committee by Octo mid-October that they need to vote against these proposals. That is the very specific next step. So creating noise in the media, creating noise in communities, calling for people to call their MEPs, to tweet their MEPs, to meet their MEPs in person and tell, share these concerns with them. All right, uh, so uh, at least uh, the good thing is that they are not proposing to extend the copyright time for Mickey Mouse and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, another thing is also, uh, does it mention anything about the repercussion of, uh, of breaking uh, the copyright law should be in each country? So for instance, in Denmark, we have currently a proposal on the way for, uh, against extremistic content. So if... Uh, they deem that you have some extremist content on your website, they will administratively shut it down and delist de the domain at the, the DK registry okay. and then tell you. I, uh, and, I, and, and, and often it, it, it will just be hacked words, WordPress sites. So mm -hmm. people would want to take it down, but they'll first know once their domain is, is taken down administratively. So I don't think this will interfere with the local Danish uh, legal process that you just described. No, it's just that they, they want in Denmark to have, uh, they're very uh, kind of using DNS blogging uh, against copyright violations. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the, law, yeah. the, the law that's being discussed on the European uh, level 
says nothing about you know DNS blocking or ISPs or anything like that. So it's not. It it won't uh, make well. It will will make things worse because it will give publishers and so on more reason to demand these horrible tools be used yeah. for their new rights. It would be nice to have in there uh, that it shouldn't use those kind of centering. But well, absolutely. But yeah. unfortunately, so the like the chance of um, making this proposal better yeah. um, is slim. Um, so new, good new ideas are probably not going to get in there. Uh, it's right now really uh, that come down to uh, fighting the worst proposals. Yeah. So I will, I'm struggling with my internet, but somewhere in here, this is what I'm doing. Empower democracy. That's what they're doing. Empower democracy with free independent journalism. Empower now. Um, save your press. Democracy is in danger. European newspapers are in trouble. Shrinking revenues have led to job losses. Without a free press, how will we get the information we need? I mean, of course, yes, those are, that's correct. Yes, we're all worried about the future of the media. Um, the cornerstone, yes, media is great. Speaking truth to power, I agree. I agree. We embrace innovation. Okay. Not sure about that one. Um, but this is the campaign to create this extra copyright for news sites by the European News Media Association, or like whatever, the, the um, here you go. Publishers Council, news media, newspaper publishers associations, magazine media associations, and news media Europe. And all the big, like, the, the, big, the biggest proponent of this proposal is Axel Springer in Germany, but also Burda, so the publisher of, for example, Bild, the largest uh, yellow press uh, newspaper in Germany. But they have all of them on board, like, there are some rebels, there is, uh, uh, what is the, El País, I think, big um, Spanish newspaper who has come out against this, and then there are some associations of minor publishers who say this would actually harm them, uh, but in general, the big press publishers are claiming, like, we need this to protect democracy. I wonder what this, empower now, what does it do? Contact us. Why is it suddenly needed now? So what they also argue is they're not asking for an extra right, they're asking for a right that others already have. For example, music publishers have this kind of extra layer of rights. There's the artist who has the right to the song they wrote, but when they record it, when they master it and so on, the publisher has an extra layer of rights. That makes sense because the abstract idea of a song is obviously very, very different from the specific recording of a recording session of a song. And obviously a lot of work has been put, put in by the publisher to create this other work. Uh, what they want is similarly, so the journalist has the copyright of the article they wrote, and the publisher is supposed to have a copyright of the article they wrote as it appears on a website, which is not substantially different from the work of the journalist. And there is no reason for this extra layer of rights. But they are saying, we just want what music publishers have always had. That's their defense against why they need this extra thing. Um, let's see, why is it suddenly needed now? In the non-digital past, the publisher's right was not considered necessary. Yeah. Their arguments are very bad. Will it impact citizens? And then they say no. We, of course, don't want to harm anyone from sharing and linking to our articles, but that's just not true. The law does not limit it to Facebook and Google. I do believe that the publishers themselves don't have the intention of going after each one of us if we quote them on our blog posts. That is not their intent. They want the millions from Facebook and Google, but the law they are asking for to, do, to enable them to do so would affect us all and creates legal uncertainty for us all. For this uh, campaign, um, I just had it open. It's save your press and hashtag publishers right. Hashtag save your press. The, the, the accounts are, for example, magazine media, at magazine media, or at, at news media Europe, but hashtag save your press. Just search for that and you will find their propaganda. Someone else had a question but sat down again, sorry. Um, 
Firstly, I think you, um, you condensed the argument down very well, and you, you picked out four key points that you were criticising. Um, the second part is um, the law already exists to sue people for copyright infringement. So what this law seems to be doing is um, giving, giving, let's say, a pop artist the right to say, um, my music was used on YouTube, and now I need to sue, um, get some money for that. And it also um, stops news aggregation, like on Google. And the BBC also do news aggregation. They, um, they have a photocopy of all the front pages of every newspaper in the morning. And you can actually read the, 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 the whole front page because the, the resolution's that good. Um, again, the, the law's already there to protect the newspapers. So what they have to do is sue the person who's published their stuff. And then, it, let's say I uploaded something, I've a copyright infringed, uh, I've infringed somebody's copyright. Then it's up to the person who got, that company who got sued, to then go and sue me. I uploaded it, let's say onto YouTube. So you have to sue YouTube and then sue the person who uploaded it. And that's the correct way to do it. And the, on, the only reason they don't allow that is because you need the address of the person who uploaded it. And so your argument is very watertight and you've presented it really well. And that's it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll say some things on, yes, so it already exists. Um, so if someone's, you know, reposting a whole article from a newspaper on a blog post or something like that, of course uh, the publisher can already sue them. They need, they need to have, you know, their documents in order that they have transferred the copyright from the author of the original piece to them, and then they can go to court. What actually the, uh, the sensible proposal by this Maltese person who listened to all the voices uh, was on this issue was let's change this from an extra right for publishers to an assumption that works in court that the publisher represents the interests of the actual copyright holder, the journalist, because that would be that would be useful. Uh, then they could sue people easier for actual abuse because the, they wouldn't have to complicatedly uh, prove in court that they represent the journalist who published at their medium. It would be a, just a general assumption that unless there is a sign against it that they, they are the uh, correct right holder to, to, be, to have a legal standing to actually sue. Um, but of course, yeah, this, this compromise proposal is now dead. Um, and they claim that that's somehow not enough. Um, I want to say one more thing. And, and the law is already in place for the censorship machines because right now, of course, a right holder can request that YouTube, can demand that YouTube take down content if it is their copyrighted content. What they are proposing is to automate that process to try and stop it from even getting online. So that's the difference they are asking for now. They already have the right to take it down if they find it. They want to prevent it from ever being online. And that's why they want to surveil all of us to make sure we don't upload something copyrighted. Uh, this extra copy of our news sites, I should mention it already exists in Germany and in Spain. They have already tried implementing that. It's called the Leistungsschutzrecht in Germany and Canon AIDE, I think, in Spain. So when they implemented it in Germany, but in Germany it was limited only to news aggregators, it was squarely uh, uh, aimed at Google. What Google did as a result was to not show snippets of content anymore from the publishers who wanted money for doing so. What happened? Well, the traffic to these publishers plummeted. They got less readers. Um, and so they decided to give Google a free license to use their snippets so that Google would restore their full functionality and send them the readers they wanted. So they ended up giving the company they were targeting, they were hoping for money from, it ended up they are in a stronger position. So they gave them a free license, but of course they didn't give anyone else a free license. So there were several news aggregator startups in Germany, or like privately run platforms and so on, who don't have that right now. So it ended up making Google stronger in Germany and everyone else, it killed everyone else because no one else can negotiate, afford to negotiate with all these media companies to get a free license. So then Spain decided, oh, let's also implement this amazing idea, but let's learn from the German example and let's make it legally impossible to 
not to, to give out a free license. Um, and so Google News in Spain, Google looked at this in Spain and said, okay, we cannot run Google News anymore under these circumstances and shut it down. Again, the traffic to the news sites plummeted and the publishers went to the Spanish politicians and said, you have to do something. You have to demand that Google keep running this service and also pay us money for the privilege of doing so, for sending us uh, readers. And the politicians said, well, we can't really do that. We can't force a company to run a service they don't want to provide. Um, so in neither of these cases, did anyone get any extra money? Did any journalist get any extra cent? Did any, was any journalism saved or anything like that? Uh, and the reaction of Commissioner Oettinger was, well, it hasn't been tried on a large enough level yet. If all of Europe has this law, then you know, all the big US companies will say, OK, we're just, we're just going to pay up. Uh, so there's nothing structurally wrong with these proposals. That they failed so horribly is not a sign to discourage us from doing it. We need to do more of it. Um, might it not be possible to use this case with uh, Google to g gain a certain kind of leverage for the smaller companies to demand by the uh, courts of law to get equal rights because now Google is favored in, uh, over these smaller companies while the um, commission against, uh, how we, would you call it? Sorry, lost my words. Cartel uh, I, forming would mm. pro prohibit that. Yes, so there are com competition concerns if they give Google a free license but nobody else. Um, so that's the situation in Germany. Germany actually might uh, abolish this law altogether because there were some procedural mistakes that they made. They should have uh, gotten EU permission to do so, but they didn't. So this German law might soon be obsolete. Um, the proposal for doing this on the European level, uh, we do not expect that Google will get a free license uh, from the news. Well, it might happen, it might not happen, but I can't really like, you're right that if it comes to that point at the European level that they give Google a free license and nobody else, we might have grounds, or the small publishers might have grounds to sue them on anti-competitive reasons. But again, like, that will take years where we'll have just uncertainty about what we can link to uh, on the internet. So I agree with you, but it's, it's not an argument that wins us the, the fight now. Uh, it might in a few years. In the spirit of workshops, I'm going to try something here uh, in the form of maybe a question, maybe something to think about. When I look at, and you've described a bit, uh, we've even looked at the websites of those who are campaigning to push this through, and you've discussed a bit, which I think is extremely important, the human, uh, the individuals within the European Parliament who, whether whatever party they're from, that they actually listen and those that don't. But it makes me wonder, as far as you understand, how is this movement, if I can call it a movement, between the Mozillas or the Bits of Freedoms or the, those on the side of not going in this direction, right, an alternative direction, how are they seen by those who seem to, well, never vote with them? Because I'm kind of curious about that image and why is it we can't get some of them to listen. I understand that a large section will never listen, but you mentioned the sort of in-betweens, the they don't show up, but they might be on our side, or they're sometimes on our side, we're not sure. I'm wondering how to reach them and how they see the movement right now. That's an excellent question. I'm not sure what this microphone is picking up, but, um, oh, it's a different tent, I guess. Okay. Um, I wish I had a good answer to that. So I think in general, I mean, the. The general impression by politicians, by older politicians in the European Parliament and everywhere is copyright is good, it protects our creators, uh, US companies are bad generally, like big US internet giants are bad, we don't have any of them in Europe, so they're like this foreign threat, um, so, and, and they are, I mean, of course, there's a lot to criticize about Facebook and Google. Uh, and. So they are, they have a very, like, even we are actively avoiding appearing to be in any way, you know, close or interested in the business of, you know, Google and Facebook and all these giants because we're always accused of just being in their pocket. Like the whole internet freedom community, like internet digital rights community is obviously like just in Google's and Facebook's pocket and they just want to um, 
enrich them at the expense of our poor European cultural industries and the individual artists and creators. Um, there, there is, you know, there is a tiny bit of truth to the fact that many of these organizations receive some funding from Google. <laughs> um, Google is one of the few companies that actually invests money in like keeping the internet open, even though they do like contradictory things partly on their business policies, but but it's not a it's not an influence that you know it's not the reason why these organizations fight for these things, but it is true that many of these organizations, if you trace their funding back, Google is somehow involved in a tiny bit in, in many of them, uh, and that's actually maybe even harmful, I don't know, because it, it opens them up to this criticism uh, that they're just, you know, fronts for Google or something ridiculous like that. Uh, so I would actually prefer if Google um, does not have their fingers in this at all. Um, and I'm very annoyed that in the, in the media, it's always like they quote the, the press publishers saying we need this, and then they quote like Google or Facebook saying this is bad, but they never quote the digital rights activists, they never quote the independent academics uh, so it's always framed as this fight between two corporate interests, and then the MEPs decide to be on the side of the European cultural industries rather than the US giants. And these lobbies, the digital rights, the startups, the libraries, they're just not strong enough. They just don't have the resources to talk to each MEP five times to convince them. There is such an uneven fight there. Um, so we, we need desperately more people on this side to you know, fly to Brussels and request meetings with their local MEPs and explain to them, look, this is, this is really important. This is what it will, the effect it will have. Because the general, like, if we don't do that, they will just assume more copyright is better. So let's just go with more copyright. As for, like, why the left doesn't care, I mean, it's a, I think it's a resource problem. Again, the left is a fairly small group in the European Parliament. They have two representatives in this Legal Affairs Committee out of these 40. And these have to like, cover all the legal affairs issues in all of Europe, and they're busy with other things. Uh, so they, they don't really have, like there's not one person who can dedicate all this effort to this issue. I mean, most of these MEPs, of course, aren't topical experts on this. Uh, each group nominates one person to be their spokesperson. Um, and, but my MEP, who I work for, Julia Rida, is, is actually the only one who is an expert on these issues in the parliament and can hold a, you know, sustain a conversation on the policy details of it. Everyone else is talking in slogans they picked up from somebody, and our side is not the one providing the slogans right now. Uh, firstly, thank you for, um, for educating us all on this. Um, so you were saying about the situation in Germany and Spain uh, where they applied this and, and then decided to reverse it based on losing hits, uh, losing traffic. If this was applied throughout the whole of the EU and Google, um, just as an example, turned around and said, right, we are not, we're not paying, we're not doing business at all, who do you think would lose out more, Google or the news uh, uh, throughout Europe? So my estimate is that the relationship is symbiotic. Um, I think it's right that publishers are, con are concerned about the shift of power towards these platforms, like which news we consume is now more controlled by Google and Facebook than by the news publishers mostly. If we stop having a subscription to a paper, if we stop going to the news sites every day, uh, this power is shifting, especially with this like instant articles and all these features where they're trying to get the whole thing into Facebook. This, these are real concerns. But the fact that people are sharing um, articles, I think, um, does not mean that uh, something is, like, this does not harm the publishers. It, it benefits them. And of course, it benefits Facebook also if people are debating around news articles. And it's actually, you know, true. Not everyone who engages with some, something on Facebook has actually read the article. We all know that, right? The comment section, like half of these people have not clicked, have not given any revenue to the publisher. But that's just, you know, that's like people passing by a, a news agent on the street. Not everyone like, who reads the headline will buy the product. That doesn't mean that, that like, this should be changed by law. Um, that's what they're proposing, kind of. Like, if you even read the headline at a, at a subway stop at the news agent or something, you would already need to pay a license to... Uh, receive this content. Um, so I think the relationship is symbiotic. I think 
both would lose out. Like if, if Facebook stops allowing us to share European news uh, articles or, or makes them uglier, like this doesn't provide the nice thumbnail and so on. Well, I mean, users will, like Facebook will find something else to fill this space. They will post more cat videos or whatever. Um, users will have less access to information, to, to news, um, and publishers will have less readers. So both of them, like, I, I think actually the balance of power is probably more towards the platforms. I think the publishers will lose out more. We think that it's partly part of their strategic thinking of these huge publishing houses like Axel Springer, that if they generally harm like news being shared on social media, people will start going to Bild.de again. People will start typing in their addresses again because they are in you know, their common knowledge. Like if you don't see news on Facebook anymore, they think people will go to them again for the news. This is of course their ideal outcome. Um, but then all the independent ones lose because platforms like Facebook and aggregators, of course, provide a level playing field for independent news to also uh, be seen like, like the big publishers. And of course, the big publishers don't like that. Sure. Hi, Christopher. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm doing a live radio show here from Shah every Excellent. night at uh, 1030. Uh, we infringe on the copyright in all means we can because this is Shah. Well, we do care about valuable content, so I would like to invite you as a guest on our table to continue this discussion uh, online. Sure. Yeah? Um, talk to me afterwards about time and so on, but okay. I'd be happy to. Okay, but again, um, I don't know how much time we have left. I think a little. Um, okay, so I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to ask you uh, to shout out any ideas you have of what you personally could do, like, do you, can you think of, in your country, organizations that you can engage on this topic, user groups, press contacts, uh, YouTubers, like, how can we make a big stink about that? How can we turn it into a new actor? Who has ideas? So digital rights organization? Yes, Free Software Association, that's a good example of, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, would, um, I would suggest, for example, putting the ID on the developer community of doing something like a browser that would work as a proxy, which uh, you would, for example, see an, um, an, a, news, a news that you'd like, and then you flag it, and uh, it would automatically create um, um, in an independent, uh, like for example, where is that software, um, like the blockchain and the torrent, um, uh, there's a, where you can um, uh, spread the, all the blog posts uh, between the, 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 the users, I don't remember now the name, but the idea is to create a, like the Google News uh, website. Like a censorship Google, resistant aggregator. Uh, yes, yeah, so, but it would uh, aggregate and uh, select uh, through everybody's views and um, uh, for that, uh, you know, it, it would be that there would be no target for the Springer Verlag to uh, to sue to, because to it sue. would be distributed. Yes, I like it. Yes, solve the problem with technology. That's good. I think we should wait for that until like we have lost the fight on the legislative side. <laughs> I think it's more important to try to prevent the <laughs> rules. But of course, we, we we will find as a community workarounds if they are implemented. Yes. I'm, one I'm last confident. point. Uh, one thing that uh, I find extremely insulting by the, the Parliament, the European Parliament, I've, tr I've been trying and uh, calling and uh, writing, is that they take um, a different view between citizens and uh, institutions. Mm. They value, you feel that they value more institutional um, um, interests than the, the citizen, which is the, the, the key uh, constitutional um, um, a, a creator of the the the, the, the whole society, yes. and uh, that is one conservative uh, European uh, feature that insults me uh, much. For example, when museums now they have special uh, copyrights for their the, the the works that they have in their collections, and they should be on the public domain yes. for all. Uh, that's uh, that's insulting, and this idea of having, for example, academia as an institution separate. Uh, from the the, um, the um, scientific uh, research that an individual can do, um, um, 
it's um, one thing that should people should have, but um, people are very conservative at, and uh, fail, think in institutional terms uh, uh, more um, more uh, naturally. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, thanks for that input. Um, I mean, like, if a representative of the music industry goes to an MEP and requests a meeting, they will first say, I represent 300,000 artists all across Europe. I represent the cultural industry of Europe. And then give their arguments that are mostly in favor of the industry and not actually these individual artists. But they have this claim to represent everyone. And if individual citizens come, then, well, they, don't, they can't claim to speak for everyone in the same way. I think one of the things we need to do is organize more into such membership organizations. So for example, I think the YouTube creators of Europe should have some kind of association that can say, I represent whatever, three million teenagers on YouTube creating fun stuff, and we're also valid creators, and we have a different opinion than the, the collecting societies do and the, and the uh, industry does. But of course, that's just not happening. They're not organizing so far. They're not aware of this. But if, if someone has ideas on how to stimulate that, that would be immensely important that we have organizations, they're not going to have the same resources, but that they can at least claim, okay, we represent someone who is not being heard in that process right now. Oh, sorry, did you want to go afterwards? Well, in the next time in Germany, we have elections. Yes. And uh, the pre-election times are the only time the, the meetings of all par parties, whatever, because, well, they have a little bit an ear, but mostly in the press, there are uh, articles about these meetings. And if we are strong enough to get these things in the press, it will be wider spread. Yes, I absolutely agree. Uh, can you give the microphone to the gentleman? Um, so I think it's tricky again because, like for example, the Guardian. Uh, we wanted to, like, uh, we thought we could offer some commentary there and try to convince the journalists to write about this issue. But the publishing house, even though it's one of Europe's coolest, I would say, is in favor of this right. So. The, there is some conflict of interest, but at least we should be reaching all the independent, all the small, all the online press uh, on this. Um, and I agree we should, we should make more effort there. The German elections are actually right now harmful to us and not beneficial because the German Social Democrats have decided not to say anything about this issue until the election is over um, because they are afraid of angering the tabloid media in Germany and then they won't be able to fight for the chancellorship anymore. So they are not going to come out against these proposals because they're scared of the press. And, and, that, and do you remember the press publisher saying, like, for a free and open and pluralist press, we need these laws? Actually, right now, we're seeing repression of opinion in favor of these laws because politicians are afraid to anger the tabloids by arguing against them. So, the German elections are actually a bad, bad thing for us right now. I hope they will be over and then the Social Democrats will be free to oppose these plans. Because the German Social Democrats are fairly influential. There are several, a lot of them. The local press. Yes, the small ones. Yes, we need them all. The small press, uh, the local press, uh, they are not uh, so uh, limited and they... Well, they have many readers. I agree. Much more than the big press. Help us and speak to your local, uh, regional press and, and ask if you can write uh, uh, you know, a letter uh, or a guest article or talk to their journalists, tech journalists maybe, or something about that. It's a good proposal. We should all do it. Uh, you mentioned before about the or musicians. I, I don't think Prince is on YouTube. He protected his stuff very well. Um, the other thing is successful lobbying um, in the UK, it's all done through post and letters, and that's the most powerful thing we have. That's an excellent thing to say because, so from my experience working in the European Parliament, so the number one way citizens contact us is via email. The number one way there is via some kind of form emailing system where like a hundred 
thousand copies of the same email against, I don't know, TTIP come in. Of course, as soon as they start clogging the mailbox, someone creates a filter, they're all sent to some folder and never seen again. If there's a large number, it will, like the MEP will be aware that there's a large campaign happening. I know that in the past years, year we had campaigns for the rights of rabbits. I'm not sure exactly what it was about uh, against like bullfighting and like I, I'm aware of these things, um, but they don't have very much of an impact. What does have an impact is phone calls. So MEPs, you know, there's not a lot of attention paid at the European level in, in pol to politics in Europe. Everyone's paying attention at the national level instead. Um, and the phone hardly ever rings. And if it does, it's someone else from the parliament. So the phone will be picked up. You will reach an assistant. Um, and if you share your concerns with them, they will listen. And if the phone rings a lot, they will notice and they will tell their MEP. So calling your MEP is important. You should, though, make sure to call an MEP who is working on this issue. Um, so can you find this on our site? Let me just think. Um, I will add to our website, which is juliareda.eu, and then you can find in the menu an item about EU copyright reform, where, which is what I've been projecting. Uh, I will add a list of uh, the responsible spokespeople at the different uh, parties, so you know who to uh, focus on calling. Um, that's the tier one, is the, the one MEP per group that you should call. Tier two is all the members of the Legal Affairs Committee, because these are the ones who are going to vote in October. So that's about 40 people. So for most countries, you will have your country's representative in that committee. So calling these uh, will be extremely impactful. Um, all the other MEPs are busy with other stuff. They won't be in this issue. They, it, it could also be useful to tell them, hey, I really care about this copyright thing. Please investigate. Uh, but I don't expect much impact. But the ones in the Legal Affairs Committee, we can have an actual impact on. Do you want to say it in the microphone? Use the, uh... Yes, so on the savethememe.net website, if you scroll down, like I showed before, there is this tool to call your MEP, and they already only show you Legal Affairs Committee MEPs, I think. Um, so use this tool to call MEPs, and then you'll be sure to reach someone who will listen to you. And like I said, it is effective. Any other ideas? Ideas, ideas, over here. What can we do? What can you do? What are you going to do? You need a mailing list, and you need to write down people's names, and that's, you have to kick their asses to get them to do stuff. Absolutely. So on, well, I could pass a paper around. Um, well, I don't have paper, actually. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to take out your smartphone, which you have with you, I know. Don't make excuses. <laughs> Uh, where is it actually, though? Yes, so if you go to juliareda.eu, juliareda.eu, on the contact page, uh, there is a form to sign up for her newsletter. Um, so, and there's a comment form where you can type, like, copyright or something like that. Uh, if you sign up here, I will do my best to keep you informed. Um, but yeah, I'm really hoping that you understand the urgency of this matter. It is a winnable fight, I think. It's not all lost. It, like, the majority is not like three quarters against us. It's more like 60 against us to 40% in our favor. It won't win itself, but if we all put some energy into this and raise our voices, then it is winnable. Um, so sign up to the newsletter or just... Uh, you know, tell your local hackerspace, hold a session about this topic. Um, there's information on our website. I'm happy to provide anything else. I'm happy to do a talk via Skype or whatever, um, uh, via a free alternative to Skype, even better, um, or whatever is convenient to you. So um, let me know. Any other ideas? I don't like this microphone. This is more long term, which is not going to fix this issue, so you can walk out if you want. But there's something interesting, I think. Um, I, I live in this country, 
And over the years, you meet people, right? At this event, you meet people, but out in life, you meet people. And I've met a lot of people in my age group who are within some of these companies that we're talking about, uh, be it the publishers, since a couple are based, well, one is based here, right? Maybe some of you know in Germany, people who work for Springer. What I find interesting is there's a younger generation there. Well, not that young, middle-aged. They don't have power necessarily. Uh, maybe and I hate this microphone. Um, these individuals can be reasoned with, are open, are as we are, perhaps. And I think that in the long run, the more we engage with them, they work for the side that right now is definitely not <laughs> with us, if I say us. Um, but in the, in the future, could be if that engagement happens now. Again, it's not going to solve the immediate threat but it is going to be a more long-term game changer. Um, basically, there are real humans working for these companies. The problem is that it's too difficult to, um, to engage them and get them to, to listen. And many of them won't listen power yet. Yes. I don't know. So we I'm need a little reach... lofty there. No, I agree. We need to reach the young generation at these companies. And I'm sure in general, okay, I will send people to the mic in the middle in the future. Um, I'm sure in general, like the younger people in these corporations agree with us and they don't think that their business model can be solved by inventing new taxes on, on US corporations um, on the web. But yeah, like you said, they don't currently have the power. I wanted to mention one more idea. Um, so against in the in the SOPA PIPA fights, these fights in the U.S. against uh, these bills that were similar, kind of like ACTA in in Europe, um, they did these online campaigns where big websites had these blackouts. Um, it would be cool to do some kind of like little JavaScript campaign that any site that wants to can implement on their page. That will I don't know. Each time you click a link, have a little annoying pop-up or something saying like the freedom of links is in danger like something like that, a campaign that websites can implement. And if we manage to raise uh, the concern and level of noise to a level where big sites are also getting concerned, then they could easily just implement that campaign um, piece of JavaScript and, and spread the word like that. I think that would be useful if any JavaScript coder here feels up to uh, creating something like a link blackout a day campaign or something like that, uh, that might have an impact. I know I won't have time to, to code it, unfortunately. Um, really, like the good side, good side of this fight doesn't have enough resources. All right. I will give you one more chance to contribute your world-changing idea to stop copyright expansion in Europe. This is it. We all want to hear it. OK. Well, think about it. Maybe you can come up with something. I'm happy to. Yes, shut down the internet. Well. Yes, go ahead. Suppose if these people who have their news articles um, put on other people's sites, just put a notice saying, do not put my um, article on your website. And then perhaps if they put a tag around it, which said, this part you can put on your website if they want to. If they want their story aggregated, they can just put a tag around it saying, please aggregate this, web, this bit and pay me every time. So you can suck my data, but pay me at the same time. Does that fix their problem? Are you saying like create a, like a flatter like or no? Wait, just I'm, a voluntary Ah, to, to suggest a voluntary thing instead of yeah. this, this yeah. law. Um, I think it's cool, but I think in, in, in the point where we are at this process, like we have a vote to sway in October. Uh, so so this, this we would have had to do two years ago, I think. Um, all right, uh, then thank you very much. I, my name is Christopher Clay. I'm C3O on Twitter, letter C, number three, letter O. Uh, get in touch if I can help you with any of these ideas or projects or if you want to help with anything. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and I hope we manage to stop these horrible plans together. Thanks.